Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal to Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about somebody from history that many of you probably haven't heard about or don't know very much about. His name is Theophilus of Antioch. Now you might think, why do we want to learn about some guy who's been dead for a long time? We haven't heard of him. It doesn't really tell us much about Christ. How is this Christian? Well, actually, uh, Theophilus was an important individual. Uh, he appears to have been an early Christian leader. And some of his writings have been distorted to give people the incorrect information actually about Jesus. And one of the things I want to discuss today and cover is, for example, did he keep uh, the Sabbath or not? Did he believe in the Ten Commandments? What about idolatry? But a kind of a bigger point, was he a Trinitarian, like a lot of people have said that he was? Or was he actually a Binitarian? A Binitarian, what's that? Well, we'll get to that. First of all, as far as Antioch goes, a lot of people aren't familiar with it. So I'm going to try to use this particular point to this map here. See a modern map, and you can see uh, what's now known as Syria. Uh, in the ancient times, Antioch was in Syria, but the borders have been redrawn. So somewhere around this, lo this spot is where Antioch was, and it's currently in the country that's now called Turkey. You know, I tend to use my hand as a map sometimes. This is Jerusalem. Antioch is like kind of here. This is what we normally think of as Turkey, but Turkey goes down a little bit further. And as I said, on this particular map, uh, Antioch would be located somewhere in this region there. Okay. Now, as far as Theophilus goes, and I guess I'll hold this up, but I don't know that this is going to be seen super well. There's a list of successors according to the Eastern Orthodox Church of apostolic successors in Antioch. And it starts with Peter and then goes through some other leaders. And one of the ones in this list is Theophilus. Now, various ones think that he was the leading uh, pastor or bishop in Antioch from around 169 AD to as far as perhaps 182 or 190 AD. I've seen different uh, lists. I'd like to read a couple of things that the Church of Rome says about him. Uh, the Roman Catholics from the Catholic Encyclopedia say, Theophilus, he was a bishop of Antioch. And based on when Eusebius has him, they come up with the timing. And that basically that he, we've got, uh, he did a lot of writings, but the only one we tend to have is one called uh, Ad Auto uh, Lycum, Lycum, and it basically explains that uh, basically what was trying to happen is that Theophilus was trying to tell people that he was converted from being heathen, and he wants to talk about the ideas of God, uh, etc. But a lot of people wonder about Theophilus, and again, the, the Catholics, not in this particular, I don't want to cite this here yet, but the Catholics basically think that Theophilus is the first person to use the term Trinity, and we'll get to that later. Now, Protestant scholars, uh, Roberts and Donaldson, say the following. Theophilus occupies an interesting position after Ignatius in a succession of faithful men who represented Barnabas and the other prophets and teachers of Antioch, an ancient seat from which comes our name Christian. And we'll get to that part in just a moment. So we've got scholars that, from major groups that endorse, of, of major groups claiming to be Christian, claiming that Theophilus was one of them. Well, the Eastern Orthodox have him as one of their apostolic successors. The Church of Rome considers him a saint, and again, uh, so do uh, most Protestant groups. But I'm not sure how well they've all looked at his teachings. Now, Robertson Donaldson made some comment about Christianity and, and Antioch, and so, if you'd like to, you can go to Acts chapter 11. I'm just going to read two verses there. Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 25, says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Paul, Saul. And when he had found him, he had brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So this is where this comes from. Now, it was not actually considered to be a complimentary term, and we'll get to that uh, pretty soon. And that is, I'd like to read uh, some of the things that Theophilus wrote. This is from his uh, book one, chapter one, of his to Autolycus book. Uh, before I read anything from Theophilus, let me just say this. When you read his writings, he's kind of a poetic writer, meaning that he's not quite as 
fact, this is the facts kind of stuff. So he, his style is a little bit different. So anyway, here's some of what, uh, what he wrote. A fluent tongue and an elegant style afford pleasure in such praise as vain glory delights in. To wretched men who have been corrupted in mind, the lover of the truth does not need to heed orna ornamented speeches. So he's saying, if you're a lover of truth, you don't need to hear really fancy speeches. That's, that's not it. But they examine the real manner of the speech, what it is and what kind it is. So it's the opposite of saying, how you present material, how the speaker presents material is not nearly as important as the content. And of course, he's correct about that. Since then, my friend, you have assailed me with empty words. So he's, he was being criticized. And Christians have been criticized all the, for throughout the whole time. And if you look at the internet, you can see that uh, true Christians are criticized an awful lot these days. Empty words, boasting of your gods of wood and stone, hammered and cast and carved and graven, which neither see nor hear, for they are idols in the works of men's hands. So he's blasting idolatry. We'll get to that more later. And since, besides, you call me a Christian, as if this were a condemning name to bear. And you say, you're, you're a Christian. This is a, you're a Christian. You know what? We're seeing that in mainstream media, particularly in the West. They don't say, oh, you're a Christian, you're disgusting. But you'll see, uh, see on, the main, on, on the news, on uh, and, uh, analyst programs, and even in various confirmations of uh, judges or whatever in uh, the United States Congress, they, if, if someone claims to hold to biblical views, uh, views so, some views historically held by Christians, a lot of Congress people get all upset because they, they call you a bigot and all kinds of things if you're a Christian. Well, anyway, so Theophilus continues, says, I, for my part, if I, I am a Christian, and I bear this name, beloved of God, hoping to be serviceable to God. Yeah, I'm a Christian, and I hope God can use me, Theophilus says. For it's not the case, as you suppose, that the name of God is hard to bear, but possibly you entertain this opinion of God because you are yourself unser yet unserviceable to him. So he says, okay, you think being a Christian is a bad thing. Maybe this is because you realize you really can't serve the true God. Interesting concept, and I would say similar thing apply to those who are, are a lot of our critics today. So we also see, by the way, that Theophilus considered Jesus God because he said the name of Christian is bearing the name of God, Christ. So, again, this is somehow, this ties in with uh, Jesus here. Now, furthermore, a little later in that same letter, Theophilus continues with, and about your laughing at me and calling me Christian. You know not what you're saying. Okay? Basically, we're called Christians um, because we're anointed by God, basically. And so, he's saying, you pick on us for being Christian. There are people who pick on us for being part of the Church of God. They don't like the Church of God. Even though the Church of God was a, a term mentioned, uh, Antioch, uh, in terms of the succession list, one of the people they had listed that I held up there was Ignatius of Antioch, and he called uh, Christians, he uh, didn't use the term Christian, but what he did use were terms like, uh, he may have used it once or twice, but basically, I'm not positive on that, but I know he used the term Church of God. The Church of God in Smyrna, the Church of God, he used that uh, uh, quite a bit. So that term, that term was used uh, also by somebody from Antioch. Well, anyway, I'd like to read some stuff that Theophilus wrote about idols. Why would I want to read some stuff Theophilus wrote about idols? Because, as I mentioned before, he's considered to be one of the successors in the succession list of the Eastern Orthodox. And if you've been to any Eastern Orthodox church, you'll find that they're filled with idols. Of course, they call them icons, but basically it's the same, same thing. So let me read some of what he wrote. This is uh, Book 1, Chapter 10. Why should I further recount the multitudes of animals worshipped by the Egyptians, both reptiles and cattle and wild beasts and birds and river fishes, and even wash pots and disgraceful noises? But you cite the Greeks and other nations. And what do they worship? They worship stones and wood and all kinds of material substances. The images, as we've seen, saying of dead men. 
uh, for Pifidus found in Pisa for the making of the Olympian Jupiter in Athens, the Minerva of the Acropolis. I will inquire of you, my friend, how many Jupiters exist? For there's firstly Jupiter surnamed Olympian, Jupiter Latarius, Jupiter Cassius, Jupiter Tonus, Jupiter Propator, Jupiter Panachias, Jupiter Polycus, etc., etc., Jupiter son of Saturn, etc., etc. And if you speak of the mother of those who are called gods, far be it for me to utter my lips of her deeds or the deeds of those for whom she's worshipped. For it's unlawful for us to use such a name as these. And what vast taxes and revenue she and her sons flourished to furnish the king. For these are not gods, but idols, as we've already said, the works of men's hands and unclean demons. Now, demons aren't going around physically making idols, but Theophilus is saying this is the work of demons and you go out making these idols. And such may all those become who make them and put their trust in them. He says, if you're involved in demonism, demonism if you're going to be involved with idols. Let's see if I can find a book that I was looking for here. Yes. We have a book called Should Keep God's Holy Days or Demonic Holidays. And Apostle Paul basically says you can't share the cup of Christ, the table of Christ, and demons. But a lot of people try to incorporate demonic practices into the worship of God. Uh, this book and any others I've show up during uh, today's message are available at the ccog.org website. That's www.ccog.org. Click on the literature tab and under books and you'll find them. Anyway, continuing, this time in uh, book two uh, to Autolycus, Theophilus writes, we have shown from their own histories, which they have compiled, that the names of those who are called gods are found to be the names of men who lived among them, as we've shown above. And to this day, their images are daily fashioned, idols, the works of men's hands. So what's interesting, the office is saying, these gods that you all do were originally supposed to be kind of like men, and you guys fashioned and worshipped, and you shouldn't do this. Similarly, these the icons that you'll see in, uh, Orthodox, in various churches are supposed to be saints or female saints or whatever. Or, uh, anyway, and these the mass of foolish men serve, while they reject the maker and fashioner of all things and nourisher of all breath and life, giving credit to vain doctrines through the deceitfulness of senseless tradition received from their fathers. There's a lot of faiths that say you've got to accept tradition. Now, it isn't that tradition can't have any value, but if tradition's in conflict with scripture, it's a senseless tradition, it's deceitful. And Theophilus is warning about that. Yet people claim he's their saint, and they, they will bow down before icons and venerate them and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, Theophilus continues with, The divine law, then, not only forbids the worshiping of idols, but also the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, other stars, yea, not the heaven, nor the earth, nor the sea, and their fountains, nor rivers must be worshipped. Then in book three, related, somewhat related to this, Theophilus writes, and concerning piety, he says, they shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likes in any things under heaven above or the earth beneath, it's water under the earth, that you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. No, it's either you know, just bowing down before them. So you're not supposed to do that. Well, if you've been to Roman or Eastern Orthodox Catholic churches, you'll tend to see this. And some other faiths, like Hindus, do this as well. For I am the Lord thy God of this divine law, then Moses, who also was God's servant. Now the Catholic Encyclopedia has something interesting about this. Says, Long before the outbreak of the 8th century, there were isolated cases of persons who feared the ever-growing cult of images and saw in it danger to return to old idolatry. And then uh, one of the people they list is Theophilus. It says they denounce not only the worship but also the manufacture and possession of such images. These texts regard all idols, that is, all, that is, images made to be adored. So the Catholic Church recognizes, the Catholic Encyclopedia, that Theophilus was against all this stuff, that he's supposed to be a saint. And again, he's in the succession list according to the Eastern Orthodox. Now, another topic that, that Theophilus uh, covered, immortality. Do humans now possess immortality? Well, Theophilus said no. 
And let me read something he wrote in uh, Book 1, Chapter 7. Again, there's three books from Autolycus. And by the way, I have an article on Theophilus of Antioch. It's available at the cogwriter.com website. That's www.cogwriter.com website. Uh, it's called Theophilus of Antioch. Because I'm not going to read every word of everything that I have here. And I know sometimes I speak fast. Maybe often I speak fast. <laughs> and if I go over something, or if you want some more specifics, the article will have references that you can verify that what I've said is correct. This is what people say Theophilus taught. Okay. Anyway, regarding immortality, he wrote, When you shall put off the mortal and put on incorruption, then you'll see God worthily. For God will raise your flesh immortal with your soul, and then having become immortal, you shall see the immortal. If now you believe in him, then you shall know that you have spoken unjustly against him. So he's saying that you're not immortal now, and if you're converted, uh, you, you, can, you can see him. Uh, continuing book 2, this time chapter 27, he wrote, For if he made him immortal from the beginning, he would have made him God, so that he should incline to things of mortality, keeping the commandment of God, he should receive as his reward from him immortality, and should become God. So this is what Theophilus taught. We're not immortal now. This is something that is a gift from God. He says, For God has given us a law and his commandments, that everyone who keeps these can be saved, and obtaining the resurrection can inherit in corruption. We have a book that I just held up on the Ten Commandments. In uh, Book 2, uh, Chapter 20, uh, uh, 34, excuse me, he wrote, But God, at least the Father and Creator of the universe, did not abandon mankind, but he gave a law, and he sent holy prophets to declare and teach the race of men that each of us might awake and understand that there is one God. He taught us to refrain from unlawful uh, idolatry and adultery, uh, murder and fornication, theft, avarice, false swearing, wrath, every inconstant uncleanness, that whatever a man would not wish to be done to himself, he should not do to another. And thus he who acts righteously shall escape the eternal punishments and be thought worthy of eternal life. Furthermore, Theophilus taught the resurrection. Now this is consistent with that. As far as uh, immortality, we also have a sermon that you can find in this, uh, on this channel about uh, if Christians believe in immortality. We have an article at the cogwriter.com website on that as well. Well anyway, as far as resurrection, Theophilus wrote, but you do not believe that the dead are raised. So he's, and a lot of people today don't really believe that. They kind of believe when you die, you're not really dead. But Theophilus says, no, it'll be the dead are raised. When the resurrection shall take place, then you'll believe, whether you will or not, no. And your faith will be reckoned for unbelief unless you believe now. So he's saying, just because you'll believe the resurrection once it happens, that doesn't mean you're a believer now. If you don't believe it now, it's, just, it's a bit different. Moreover, you believe that the images made by men are gods and do great things. And can you not believe that God who made you is also to make you afterwards? Okay, so say, you know, isn't the real God able to, you know, make you again? A lot of people don't believe in a resurrection, uh, truly. Now, Theophilus also said, by the way, that one is going to be born again at the resurrection. So let me read what uh, he wrote. This is uh, Book 2, Chapter uh, 15. But the, wound, the moon wanes monthly, and in a manner dies, being a type of man, then is born again, and is crescent, for a pattern of the future resurrection. So essentially, Theophilus is teaching that you're born again at the resurrection. Now this is kind of an interesting point, because this, on this particular point, Theophilus' position is consistent not only with that of the continuing Church of God, but also the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not accept the evangelical Protestant view of being uh, born again uh, once uh, you're converted or baptized in this life, but you're, that you're born again uh, later. And so this is one where Theophilus, again, is closer to uh, the Eastern Orthodox than he is uh, some of the Protestants. Theophilus had some understanding of different aspects of God's plan. I'd like to read something from chapter 14 of book 1. To those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek immortality, he will give life everlasting, joy, peace, rest, and abundance of good things. 
which neither eye has seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of men to conceive. So Sathless is saying, and this I think is important for all Christians, that God's plan is to give life everlasting, joy, peace, rest, and abundance of good things. He also wrote in Book 2, Chapter 26, Wherefore also, when a man has been formed in this world, it is mystically written in Genesis, as if he had been placed twice in paradise, so that one was fulfilled when he was placed there, and a second would be fulfilled after the resurrection and judgment. For just as a vessel, when on being fashioned, it has some flaw, is remolded or remade, that it may become new and entire, so also happens to man by death. For somehow or the other he's broken up, that he may raise in the resurrection whole, I mean spotless, righteous, and immortal. And he also wrote uh, in chapter 34 of the second book, he who acts righteously shall escape the eternal punishments and be thought worthy of eternal life from God. Theophilus seemed to understand that God created what he did so eternity would be better. Now, Theophilus also wrote about the weather. So uh, let me, let me uh, read some of this. This is from uh, book 1, chapter 6. Yes, I know I'm quoting less scriptures than I normally do, so you don't have to go back and forth to them. Because I, I think very few people, uh, very few Christians understand a whole lot about what Theophilus taught. And again, I'm going to explain more as to why this is relevant as we go on. Some of these things, I think, are obvious as I'm doing it, and some others perhaps later. He, he wrote that God controlled the weather. He says, Consider, O oh man, his works, the timely rotation of the seasons, the changes of temperature, the regular march of the stars, the well-ordered course of days and nights and months and years, the various beauty of seeds and plants and fruits, various species of quadrupeds and birds and reptiles and fishes, both the rivers and of the sea, and consider the instinct planted, implanted in these animals to beget and rear offspring, not for their own profit, but for the use of man, and the providence which God provides nourishment for all flesh, or the subjection, sub, subjection which he has ordained that all things subserve mankind. Consider also the flowing of sweet fountains and never failing rivers, the seasonal supply of dews and showers and rains, and manifold movement of the heavenly bodies and the morning star rising, the heralding of the appoint, approach of the perfect luminary. And the constellations of Pleiades, Orion, and Arcturus, the orbit of the other stars that circle the, all the heavens, and all the manifold wisdom of God has called names by their own. He is God alone who made light out of darkness and brought forth light from his treasures and formed the chambers of the south wind. That seems to be a reference to Job 9.9. And the treasure storm houses the deep and the bounds of the sea and the treasuries of the snow and the hailstorms collecting the waters of the storehouses of the deep and the darkness of his treasures and bringing forth a sweet and desirable and pleasant light out of his treasures. Who causes the vapors to send from the ends of the earth? He makes lightnings and rain and sends forth his thunder to terrify and foretells by lightning the peal of thunder that no soul may faint with sudden shock. One of the reasons I'm mentioning this is if, if in modern times, if you say that uh, God uses weather uh, to uh, get people to, to point things out to people and to show them that things are going to change or that God maybe uses his punishment, people act like you're out of your mind. Well, it's not a brand new 20th or 21st century concept. Uh, Theophilus was teaching this as well. Anyway, he continues, And who so moderates the violence of lightnings that flashes out of heaven so that it doesn't consume the earth? For if the lightning were allowed all its power, it would burn up the earth. And thunder were allowed all its power, it would overthrow all the works therein. Now, evolutionists tend to believe in something called spontaneous generation. And so we've got a booklet called Is God's Existence Logical? I'm going to get to this in a moment from Theophilus. But I also comment we have a couple of uh, animations that you can watch regarding this. So let me read something Theophilus wrote. And this is probably around 170, 180 AD. This is from Book 3, Chapter 3. For either they made assertions concerning the gods and afterwards thought that there was no god, or if they spoke even of the creation of the world, they finally said that all things were produced spontaneously. Yea, even speaking to providence, they taught again that the world was not ruled by providence. But what? Did they not, when they essayed to write, 
even in the honorable conduct of in conduct, they teach the perpetuation of lasciviousness and fornication and adultery. Do they not introduce hateful and unutterable wickedness? So basically what he's saying is these people are claiming spontaneous, everything just showed up spontaneously. And the same people who says they promote sexual immorality and all these other kinds of things. Now I've mentioned this particular book. I'd like to actually read something from the back cover. I'm going to actually read it from the back cover of this book. Now notice, Theophilus is complaining about spontaneous generation people back uh, of, in 170, 180 AD, a long, long time ago. How, and how ridiculous this is. But let me read something. This is from Nobel Prize winner George Wald from Harvard University. He said, The reasonable view was to believe in spontaneous generation, life from nothing. The only alternative to believe is a single primary act of supernatural creation, which of course is what the Bible teaches. There is no third position. So he says there's only two ways, either some divine thing made everything, or just, just showed up on its own. One only has to contemplate the magnitude of the task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. So the reason the cover says possible, impossible. So what does he say? He's going to believe in God. No. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Okay? So he's teaching spontaneous generation, which is impossible. As a scientist, Nobel Prize winning scientist says he's believing something is impossible. Which, by the way, if you go through here, the only thing to logically conclude is there is a God. It's the only explanation that makes sense. And it's the only one that's not impossible whereas uh, those are. But again, I wanted to point out this idea of spontaneous generation. Don't think it's just some, something that somebody came up with or Charles Darwin came up with or whatever. This has been an old concept. Oh yeah, Charles Darwin popularized it. But the idea is very, very old. And this is bad back then. The Apostle uh, Paul wrote about some people like this, those who push sexual immorality, etc. Verse uh, 18 of uh, Romans chapter 1. Paul wrote, For the wrath of God is revealed against heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known by God is made manifest to them, and God has shown it to them. Okay? Nobel Prize winner knows th th that Life is too complicated to have spontaneously generation, generated, and it's impossible. Therefore, if God's made it clear, he should know. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so they're without excuse. Because even though they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the corruptible God, and the image made of a corruptible man. And he's talking about some of these idols we were talking about before. Therefore God gave up to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And that's what Theophilus was saying was happening. These people's spontaneous generation of the universe, they were all into all kinds of sexual immorality. And in verse 26, Paul wrote, For this reason God gave them over to vile passions, even though their women changed exchange the actual, natural use for what's against nature. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what's shameful, and they'll get the penalty for what they're due. And because they did not want to retain God in their knowledge, God filled them up with a debased mind to do things which aren't fitting. All unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, etc., maliciousness. Some of the things that Theophilus was talking about. Now, you might say, but yeah, but these are modern scientists like Dr. Wald, accepting spontaneous generation. Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'm going to read this from the Old King James Version, I'd like to read something the Apostle Paul wrote about knowledge or science. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, Old King James. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. It's not a science to believe in the impossible. Okay? It's not scientific. Science, the logical thing is to believe in God. Science does, true science does align up with Scripture. 
But more and more you're going to see this. Uh, secular sources, encyclopedias, news sources, so-called scientists, cling to stuff that's simply not true. This has been a pro it was a problem in Paul's day. It was a problem in Theophilus' day. And Theophilus has pointed this out. Again, this book is also available at ccog.org. What about the Ten Commandments? You've got uh, various ones these days who uh, don't uh, observe the Sabbath. They don't think Christ early Christians did. Well, Theophilus was a converted Greek, by the way, uh, so uh, we'll get to, to this. And you've got some Protestant uh, leaders. Uh, Andy Stanley comes to mind as a modern one who thinks the Ten Commandments were done away and you didn't have to keep them. But that was not the view of early Christians and certainly was not the view of Theophilus. And let me read what he wrote uh, about some of the commandments. This is from uh, Book 2, uh, chapters uh, 11, 12, and 14. Theophilus wrote, And on the sixth day God finished his works which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all the works which he began to create. Moreover, concerning the seventh day, which all men acknowledge, but, but the most know not that what among the Hebrew is called the Sabbath, is translated into the Greek as the seventh, a name which is adopted by every nation, although they don't know the reason for the appellation. Let me interject there. Throughout various languages, uh, they've got a word for Sabbath. Sabato, for example, Sabbath, uh, Saturday or Sabbath in uh, uh, Spanish. And uh, the, even the Russians have a ver even Russians got a version of it. So what Theophilus is saying is that they call it day of Sabbath. They don't really know, the heathen don't really know where it comes from. Anyway, God, having thus completed the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them on the sixth day, rested the seventh day from all the works we had made. Now, Theophilus also wrote, Now we confess that God exists, that He's one, the creator, the maker, and the fashion of the universe. We know all things are arranged by His providence, by Him alone. And we have learned a holy law. What's the holy law? We'll get to this. But as we have lawgiver him, who is really God, who teaches us to act righteously and to be pious and do good. And concerning piety, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image, any likes of anything in heaven above, and the earth beneath, and water on the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them, for I, the, the Lord your God. And doing good, he said, honor your father and mother, that it may be well with thee, that your days may be long in the land which is... I, the Lord, give you. And concerning righteousness, you should not commit adultery, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor, you should not covet your neighbor's wife, you should not covet your neighbor's house, nor his land, nor his manservant, his maidservant, nor his ox, nor beast of burden, nor any of his cattle, nor anything that's in his neighbor's. Of this divine law, then, Moses, who is God's servant, has made the minister both to all the world, and chiefly the Hebrews. Of this great and wonderful law, which tends to all righteousness, the ten heads are such as we've already rehearsed. The ten heads, he means the Ten Commandments, which he already rehearsed. Now this is in book three. So in earlier books, he talked about the Sabbath, he talked about the idolatry, he talked about all kinds of stuff, and he says that this. In book two, he says, God has given us a law and holy commandments that everyone who should keep them can be saved and obtain the resurrection can inherit in corruption. I mention this because there are some who don't think they need the Ten Commandments or they think they're done away. Some believe they were renumbered, but the way we in the Continuing Church of God number the Ten Commandments is the same way that early Christians did, same way that Jews did, it's also the same way the Protestants now do, but it's also the same way the Eastern Orthodox do. Uh, the Church of Rome changed uh, their order, if you will, uh, of the Ten Commandments. But to learn more about the Ten Commandments, why they're important, yes, we have a free book, but uh, the Ten Commandments, and the subtitle is The Decalogue, Christianity, and the Beast. The Beast is not going to want you to keep the Ten Commandments, and people in the world don't really want you to do it now as well, because... If you keep them, then the implication is that they're doing something wrong because they don't want to keep them. Now, as far as the Sabbath goes, I read uh, some of that regarding uh, Theophilus. I'd like to read uh, something else. And this is from the Syriatic version of Eusebius Church History. 
Uh, now Eusebius was a writer. He was put in charge of writing a history for uh, Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. But here's what this says. Again, this is from uh, the Syriatic version of it, so we'll get to this here. It says, But to Theophilus, concerning whom we have said, he was bishop or pastor of Antioch. There are three treatises by him against Antiochus, and another which is inscribed, Heresy Against Hermogenius, which he uses as testimonies from the Revelation of John. And there are other books by him which are suitable for teaching. But those who pertain to heretical doctrine, even at the times like terrors, were corrupting pure seed and the doctrine of the apostles. But the pastors, which were in the churches of every country, were driving them like beasts of the wilderness away from the flock of Christ. So he's saying that Theophilus was trying to drive people away from doing the wrong thing. Uh, by teaching uh, and exhorting the brethren. But another time, openly before their face, they contended with them in discussion, put them to shame, and also by writing treatises, or papers, they diligently refute and expose their opinions. Theophilus, together with others, contended against them. Well, when you contend earnestly for the faith once for all deliver the saints, you are sometimes contending against others. And he is celebrated for one treatise, which, he's able, which was ably composed by him against Marcion. We're going to explain Marcion in just a minute. Which, together with the others which I've mentioned, is still preserved. And after him, Maximus received the bishopric of the Church of Antioch. But Philip, uh, we've also learned, did a treatise against Marcion. Now it's interesting that Philip and Theophilus wrote against the heretic Marcion. Marcion is believed to have been the first one that they know of who wrote against the Sabbath. It's possible that people like Just, not, well, well, Justin Martyr uh, followed the, the lead, I guess, of Marcion. But it's possible people like Simon Magus uh, and Serinthus also done away with the Sabbath. We're not sure. But the first one we know of was Marcion. Now, this is important because uh, Polycarp of Smyrna denounced Marcion, as well did... Uh, Theophilus, uh, a successor to Theophilus, a by the name of uh, Serapion. Serapion taught against uh, Marcion. And this is what he wrote. This is Serapion. Now Serapion was killed around 211 AD. Okay? We, in the Continuing Church of God, consider that the leaders up through Serapion in Antioch uh, were, were, were Church of God leaders. Now they weren't perfect. And by the way, none of their writings are Scripture. As a matter of fact, as far as Scripture goes, the only Scripture we accept uh, is, up th is what's in this particular book, which goes through the book of Revelation. We don't accept... God may decide later that some writings, some certain Church of God writers uh, could be Scripture, but until God says so, we don't accept any, which means that sometimes people write things that they may not always be completely accurate, uh, even though they could be in the Church of God, and I would say that's the case with Theophilus and, and others, um, including my own writings and the writings of other Church of God leaders. Uh, they're not Scripture of God until God says, says otherwise. Anyway, or if God says otherwise, Serapion wrote, Moreover, brethren, we have discovered to what kind of heresy Marcion adhered, and seen how he contradicted himself, not understanding of what he was speaking, as you will gather from what's been written to you. For having borrowed the said gospel from those who are familiar with it from constant perusal, namely the, from the successors of those who were his leaders in the heresy, whom we call the docete, we were able to read it through, and while we found most of the concepts agree with Orthodox God the Savior, we found things inconsistent with that, and these things we set down for your inspection. So what Serapion is saying is that Okay, not only did he denounce Marcion for various things, but some of his writings had some parts that were okay, but parts that were not. We see the same thing in, for example, the interfaith movement. they got some parts that are good and some parts that aren't. And Serapion is warning about Marcion, and he shouldn't go about these things as far as that goes, as far as his writings. Now, what's interesting is we had Polycarp, Theophilus, and Serapion, uh, right against, and Philip, right against Marcion. This is interesting or important because the Church of Rome actually tolerated Marcion for a long time. But uh, the Church of God leaders uh, in Asia Minor and in Antioch uh, did not. Now, there's something else I want to read 
uh, from Serapion. And it's important because Theophilus was before Serapion, and so you'll see how this ties in just a moment. Serapion wrote, For we, brethren, received Peter and the other apostles of Christ, but we reject intelligently the writings falsely ascribed to them, knowing that such were not handed down to us. And what he's talking about is what's called the Gospel of Peter. So what happened is Serapion went and visited some people uh, in northern Africa. He says, When I visited you, I suppose you held the true faith. And as I had not read the Gospel which you put forth in the name of Peter, I said. So then I learned that this is not, was not it, and you've got various other heresies. And therefore, basically, he said, Look, uh, we have the faith... We have the books that were handed down to us. Gospel Peter's not one of them. Those of you who don't have it, you're not part of our faith. Uh, and we in the Continuing Church of God say, if you don't believe everything is this book, you don't have the faith. If you think other books should be in this, that's not the faith either. Um, and I've also got various things that uh, Strapping wrote. I even have it in Greek here. But what I find important or wanted to point out is that Serapion said the books were handed down. Other Church of God writers said the same thing. Well, if they passed on to uh, Serapion, then they passed through Theophilus, so he would have had the correct books of the books of the Bible, and would not have used would not have used the false the false books that other people other people have used. Now, I guess before going further, as far as the Sabbath goes, let me read something from the historian uh, Sozomen. And he wrote this in the mid-5th century, as far as the Sabbath goes. The people of Constantinople, almost everywhere, assembled together on the Sabbath, as well as the first day of the week, which custom was never observed at Rome or Alexandria. So Sabbath keeping was still going on. Yes, I know that the Greco-Romans and Asia Minor were doing both, uh, in the 5th century, they were doing Saturday and Sunday. But this is this shows, by the way, because this is a Gentile area, that the Gentiles did not immediately switch over to Sunday, which is what many Protestants, uh, Catholics would have you believe. That was simply not the case. Uh, the faithful continued to keep Saturday and did not switch over to, to also doing Sunday. And you can verify this with writings, for example, from the saint and doctor of the Roman Catholic uh, Church, Jerome, who talked about the Nazarenes who were still Sabbath keepers and that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, the biggest thing really to push with Theophilus is his position on the Godhead. And the reason it's important to know is because people have cited him as the source for the Trinity, the earliest source of the Trinity. And that's simply not true. Interestingly, the old Worldwide Church guy had a booklet on the Trinity and said that Theophilus, is, Theophilus was not endorsing the Trinity either. But let me read what uh, some of what Theophilus wrote. This is in his book 1, uh, chapters 3 to 5. He says, You will say to me, Do you who see God explain to me the appearance of God? Here, man, the appearance of God is uh, indescribable. It cannot be seen by eyes of flesh, for in glory he is incomprehensible, in greatness unfathomable, in goodness and in kindness unutterable. For if I say he's light, I name but his own work. If I call him word, I but name is sovereignty. If I call him mind, I speak of his wisdom. If I say he's spirit, I speak of his breath. If I call him wisdom, I speak of his offspring. If I call him strength, I speak of his sway. If I call him power, I mention his activity. If I call him kingdom, but I, I mention his glory. If I call him Lord, I mention him being judge. If I call him judge, I speak of him as being just. I call him father, I speak all things of him. If I call him fire, but mention his anger. For the heavens are his work, the earth is his creation, the sea is his handiwork, man is his formation. So he uses a lot of terms in poetic form, so sometimes a little tricky to, to get. Now, he also said something here that I guess I should comment, and that is that uh, he says that God gets angry. And let me read this. You will say to me then, is God angry? Yes, he is angry with those who act wickedly, but he's good and kind and merciful to those who love and fear him, and is the chastener of the godly and the father of the righteous. 
that he's a judge and punisher of the impious. Now, those of us in the literalist camp, that means those of us who think the Bible means what it says, do believe that God gets angry, because the Bible says this in multiple places. But those from Alexandria at the time, uh, such as uh, Origen, who was alive uh, when uh, part of, uh, when Theophilus was around, Theophilus I think was older, but Origen, Alexandria, and he seemed to write, start writing about the same time as Theophilus, he said, but when we read either the Old Testament or the New, the anger of God, we do not take such expressions literally, but we seek in them a spiritual meaning that we may think of God as He deserves to be thought of. What does that mean? What that means is, there's a view, and I actually was talking to a Catholic a few weeks ago who brought this view up, and I was surprised he would, that God doesn't get angry, God's so unfathomable that nothing that we know God is really like. And... So Origen is saying that God doesn't get angry, but Theophilus is saying that he is. Why is this relevant? Because there were different groups of Christian, people who claimed to be Christian at the time. There were the faithful, and there were the, this uh, Greco-Roman confederation. And Theophilus, by the way, uh, his successor, Serapion, warned about this growing confederation that was uh, coming up. But Theophilus said that God got angry around the same time. Origen writes, God doesn't get angry. So basically those who ended up on the origin side of the camp became what we call the, the Greco-Romans, uh, of which the Protestants came out of. And those on the literal side uh, were in the Church of God. You say, but wait a second, there are a lot of Protestants and others who claim uh, to, to accept the Bible literally, and that's great. But the, the basic foundations of Protestantism, supposedly the Protestants came out of the Church of Rome, uh, or those who believe in Protestant Reformation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, as being from God or whatever they claim it is, because I don't think it was uh, the way they, they tend to think it was. But anyway, there is a big difference. And Theophilus was on the literal side, which is the same as us in the uh, Church of God. It's not that God doesn't use any allegory in Scripture, but essentially you can take the Scripture for what it says, and if, it, if what it says doesn't make literal sense, then obviously you would consider allegory. But it does make sense that God gets angry or whatever, and Theophilus said that. Now, Theophilus taught that the Father was unbegotten. And let's see if I want to go into all this. He said, The Word was God. All things came in existence through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing came in existence. The Word then being God, uh, uh, God sent Him to any place, and He was coming, and He was sent by Him, and He was heard. Now, Theophilus held what I would call a Benetarian view of the Godhead. That is, that he taught that the Father was God and the Son was God, but he did not actually teach the Holy Spirit as God, even though some people have claimed that that's what he was teaching, and he was teaching uh, the Trinity. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But here's what he's taught about the Spirit of God. This is from uh, Book 1, Chapters uh, 3 and 5. If I say he is Spirit, I speak of his breath. For as a pomegranate with the rind containing it, it has many cells and compartments which are separated by tissues, and has many seeds dwelling in it. So the whole creation is contained by the Spirit of God, and the contained Spirit is along with the creation contained in the hand of God. He also wrote, this is uh, Book 1, Chapter 7, This is my God, the Lord of all, who alone stretched out the heaven and established the breath of the earth under it. And this commenting, this gets back to his God's existence logical. He keeps saying God made everything. This is not some new idea that somebody came up with uh, to deal with a revolutionist. Uh, and gave spirit to nourish it, and whose breath gives life to the whole. Who, if he withdraws his breath, the whole would utterly fail. Therefore, do not be skeptical. This is uh, Book 1, Chapter 14. But I believe, for I myself used to disbelieve that this would take place. At the same time, I met the sacred scriptures of the holy prophets, who also by the Spirit of God foretold things that have already happened, just as they came to pass and things which are now occurring, they are happening, and things in the future in which they will be accomplished. We also have, therefore, the Apostles of Antioch saying that prophecies came forth, they're going to keep going forth. And he's saying this to somebody he's trying to get to look at Christianity. I mentioned Andy Stanley before. He also said you shouldn't use Old Testament prophecies to tell people about the Bible or Jesus or whatever. And the reality is early Christians did that, and there's lots and lots and lots of scriptures 
In the Old Testament, it proves that Jesus was going to come. We have a book, uh, Proof Jesus the Messiah. It's got over 200 from the Old Testament and over 200 fulfillments in the New Testament. But it also talks about prophecy. The uh, book of Revelation says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And a lot of people don't want to pay attention to prophecy, but the office brought it up in his arguments as well. Uh, in the, uh, the fact is that Theophilus was what uh, you would call a, a Benetarian, and I'm going to get to his, the so-called Trinitarian statements in just a moment. Now, let me explain something maybe you know, maybe you don't know. The, idea, the word Arian came from a guy named Arius. We're not talking about skinhead Arians, that are a different type of thing. Um, there's a doctor, Arius, and he uh, was essentially a Unitarian. Uh, he did not believe that uh, Jesus existed for all eternity, and he was an Arian um, from his name, meaning they added Una, meaning one, Unitarian. So you've got a group called Unitarians. The, perhaps the widest group known with that, other than the group called Unitarians, the other group who's pretty well Unitarian would be considered the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're, they're Unitarian. Um, Trinitarians are what most Greco Roman Protestants are. But Binitarians, are all, meaning the Father and Son are God, but the Holy Spirit is not considered a third part of a, a co-equal part of a Godhead. We're also called semi-Arians. That means they did not just believe that the Father was God, they also believed the Son was God. You say, well, you may not have heard of semi-Arians. Well, they're actually uh, uh, pretty important. Uh, and let me read something from the historian Epiphanius, this is mid-4th century, he wrote, Semi-Arians, they hold the truly orthodox view of the Son, that he was forever the Father, but has been begotten without beginning and not in time. But all these blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they don't count him as the Godhead with the Father and the Son. Now I would also comment here that you say, okay, so it sounds like this wasn't a whole lot of people. Well, actually it was. The Catholic Encyclopedia, by the way, said that the uh, Benetarians or the Semi-Arians were the conservative majority of, in the East, which means most people who professed Christ in the uh, fourth century held a Semi-Arian or Benetarian view of the Godhead. So a lot of people don't realize that. And actually at the Council of Nicaea, which some people have falsely claimed, uh, proclaimed a trinity, that's not the case. Uh, most of the people who went to the uh, Council of Nicaea were not Trinitarians. Only about 15% were Trinitarian, about 10% were Unitarian, and the rest of the people, about 75%, were in between or uh, Semi-Arians or Binitarians. Now, as far as the Trinity goes, the first Trinitarian statement that I've found, a clear Trinitarian statement by one who professed uh, Christ, is one of two people. One is a guy by the name of Montanist, and he said, quote, I am the Father, the Son, and the Paraclete. Paraclete being a term meaning Holy Spirit. So this is the first one that, uh, perhaps the first Trinitarian statement. Now this Montanus was uh, accepted by the Church of Rome for quite some time. He was denounced by Church of God leaders. But he uh, finally was put out of the Church of Rome. And when he did, Tertullian left. But he's the first one that I've been able to find. If he's not the first, there's another one who came around the same time, somebody by the name of Valentinus, who was also denounced by Polycarp of Smyrna, another Church of God leader. And by the way, I guess I haven't hold this, held this one up. We have a book called The Continuing History of the Church of God. This helps you understand who the true Christian leaders were before uh, and who was denouncing what heresies. The Bible says to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And most people don't know what it is. They've been misled by false teachers, false traditions, uh, mistranslations, etc. of Scripture. Well, anyway, uh, Valentinus wrote something called the Gospel of Truth. And again, he was denounced by Polycarp of Smyrna, who's a Church of God leader. And he wrote, The Father uncovers his bosom, which is the Holy Spirit, revealing his secret. His secret is the Son. Now, in the 4th century, a uh, Catholic bishop by the name of Marcellus of Ancra wrote about the nature of God. And here's what he wrote. Now, with the heresy of the Ariomaniacs, which has corrupted the Church of God, these then teach three hypost hypostases, just as Valentinus, the first uh, 
heretic invented in his book called On the Three Natures. For he was the first to invent three hypostases and the three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he is discovered to have filched this from Hermes and Plato. So those of you who think that the Trinity was an original uh, Christian doctrine, that's not the case. You won't find it in early church writings. You simply will not. Early Christians held what would be considered a binitarian view of the Godhead. And that's also the case uh, for, uh, for Theophilus, and we'll get more into that as we get further. Now, I mentioned the Catholic Encyclopedia, and so here's something that it writes. In Scripture, there is yet no single term by which the three divine persons are denoted together. The word trias, of which the Latin trinitas is a translation, is first found in Theophilus of Antioch about 180. Afterwards, it appears in Latin form in Tertullian. His writings. So basically, they're saying that, okay, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. They somehow think that Theophilus is the first one to bring it up. But you notice they don't really, uh, Theophilus didn't teach the Trinity, but they say that he brought it up and they try to give people this idea. All right. And others have uh, said the same thing about Theophilus and trying to claim that he supported. Uh, the Trinity. And Wikipedia says, for example, it's notable, the office is writing, be the earliest extent Christian work to use the word Trinity. But he doesn't use the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to describe the Trinity. So this part, at least Wikipedia got right. Maybe they'll edit this again. Rather, Theophilus puts God, his word, Logos, and his wisdom and so they, they say that uh, this is not, it wasn't the Trinity the way we understand it. Now I'm going to read the normal mistranslated version of the, what Theophilus wrote. So let me read this. It says, in like manner, this is from uh, Book 2, Chapter 15. So the most common translations are going to say this. In like manner, also the three days, which were before the luminaries, are the types of the Trinity of God and his word and his wisdom. And the fourth is the type of man who needs light so that there may be God, the word, wisdom, man. Now it's mistranslated because Trinity is not a Greek word. A proper translation of what he wrote was, in like manner also the three days, which before were, were the luminaries, are the types of the threes of God, his word and his wisdom. And the fourth is the type of man who needs light so that there may be God, the word, wisdom, and man. Now, some people on the Trinitarian side will say, oh, that's just semantics. And Theophilus really meant the Trinity, even though nobody was really teaching that, other than some heretics. Well, he's not, because the third, he's teaching what the third part becomes. He's teaching that man is now the fourth, but he's going to become the third part, if you will, because humans are God's offspring. And he sees wisdom in God's plan this way. And this is consistent with a Benetarian view. Theophilus uh, basically explained, as I read before, that he said, when you become immortal, you'll become God. And that's basically how he did this. Now, let's go to John chapter 17. John 17, starting verse 20. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through your word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me, and the glory which I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. So Christians are supposed to become one just as the Father and the Son are one. And you know what? That's what Theophilus was teaching. Now, some might say, well, you're just reading into what Theophilus wrote or saying what he didn't mean. And I admit that his writings are sometimes a bit hard to follow. But at uh, risk of repeat, book 1, chapter 3, Theophilus wrote, If I call him mind, I speak of his wisdom. If I say spirit, I speak of his breath. If I call him wisdom, I speak of his offspring. So notice that Theophilus is calling the spirit of God's breath and that 
people are to be God's offspring, we're supposed to be part of the family of God. You know, the Apostle Paul, you know, had to go there in Romans 8, 29, said, For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. As I mentioned before, Taphilus said that if humans should incline toward immortality, keeping the commandment of God, he should receive as reward from him immortality and should become God. He did not teach this idea that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three co-equal members of the Trinity. Now, I found uh, a footnote from the anti-Nicene fathers related to this once. And this is what it says. And they don't say who this eminent authority is. It says, An eminent authority says, It is certain that according to the notions of Theophilus, God, His Word, and His wisdom constitute a trinity. And it should seem a trinity of persons. He notes here, the word assigned to the Holy Spirit, although He Himself other words gives His title to the Son as is more usual with the fathers. Well, the problem with that kind of nonsense is that the term spirit is not even in improperly translated versions of uh, this stuff. If you do an honest reading of what Theophilus has actually wrote, and you can look at the Greek too. I, I saw some of the Greek online actually when I was working on this sermon. Uh, he never says the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is three parts of a trinity. He never does. He says there's a threeness associated with God, and that includes... Father, the Son, and the wisdom of God's offspring. Now, there's another way that Theophilus disagrees with the Protestants and the uh, Eastern and Roman Catholics. And that was, I'm convinced that he was a quartodeciman. What's a quartodeciman? A quartodeciman is one who keeps Passover on the 14th. There are accounts uh, that various ones were doing this because the Apostle John did it. Uh, if you read Polycrates writings, it says the Apostle John did it, the Apostle Philip did it. Uh, all the Apostles did, but in his region, uh, they were they were living. It said Polycarp did it, Thracius did it, Sigaris did it, Melito did it, Polycrates did it. Well, also, various other ones in Asia Minor did this. As it turns out, Serapion from Antioch wrote to uh, uh, Claudius Apollinaris, and said uh, he's he's a ble he's a, he's blessed, and he Claudius Apollinaris was also a well-known quartodeciman. In other words, he kept Passover on the 14th. So why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because various ones compromised. Those who didn't accept the, the Bible literally, those who went more toward allegory, decided it was okay to not do what the Bible says to keep Passover on the night like Jesus did the night of the 14th of the first month of the year called Abib or Nisan, which tends to fall in March or uh, April, usually April, uh, each year. No, no, they decided it was okay to switch it to Sunday. Now, why would they do that? Well, basically there was imperial pressure. Uh, back after the Jews revolted in 135 AD, you weren't allowed back in the city of Jerusalem, for example, if you kept Passover on the 14th, so they wouldn't do that. And this upset... Uh, various ones, and people in Rome decided, hey, you know, let's make Emperor Hadrian not so mad at us. And so they also adopted uh, uh, Sunday, as well as various ones in Alexandria, who were, who were also uh, not biblical literalists. But in Asia Minor, and up in the British Isles and other places, people were still keeping Passover on the 14th. And that's actually been in kind of an easy way to find out who made changes. One of the most widely documented early changes between the Church of God and the Greco-Roman Protestant Confederation was with Passover. Now in time, uh, when the Greco-Romans kind of took over in Asia Minor, they also uh, uh, switched on Passover. As a matter of fact, I mentioned the Council of Nicaea before, and that one of the things that was debated and the emperor decided was that Passover was not to be kept on the 14th, but instead to be kept on Sunday. In English-speaking cultures, that Sunday tends to be now called Easter Sunday. And growing up as a Roman Catholic, I had no idea that Easter Sunday was supposed to be Passover, which was a nightly uh, ceremony, if you will. It was kept at night and had to do with uh, the death of Jesus as opposed to the resurrection. But anyway, that's an easy thing to look at in order to document changes, again, difference between the true church 
and those who compromised. I mentioned before that Jude said to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Well, Jude was keeping Passover on the 14th. Greco-Roman Protestant scholars will admit that the churches in Jerusalem until 135 AD were keeping Passover on the 14th. We have Plicherty's letter to Bishop of Rome, Victor, around 190 or so AD, saying that the people in Asia Minor continued to keep Passover on the 14th. So this is, a, this is a well-documented fact, and it shows a difference, because there was a split between those who claimed uh, allegory and those who were more literal. The more literal people continued to keep Passover on the 14th, and therefore it would have been logical that Theophilus would have uh, continued to do that as well. Now, like the Apostle Paul did in Acts chapter 17, verses 23 through 28, Theophilus sometimes would cite pagan sources if they agreed with the Bible on matters or to get various points. You heard he was uh, referring to various uh, pagan deities before. So here's something from Book 2, Chapter 38 uh, that, he, that he wrote. He says, The Sibyl, then, and other prophets... And yea, the poets and philosophers have clearly taught both concerning righteousness and judgment and punishment and also concerning providence, that God cares for us, not only for the living among us, but also for those that are dead. Though indeed, they said this unwillingly, for they were convinced by the truth. And among the prophets, indeed, Solomon said of the dead, there shall be healing in your flesh and care taken of your bones. Proverbs 3.8 Okay, he had written 3.8, so let me put that in parentheses, so I better put down, that's where that came from. And the same said of David, the bones which you have broken shall rejoice. In agreement with these sayings was that of Timoclase, the dead are pitted by the loving God. So what did he do? Theophilus basically tried to reach people that he hoped would understand. So he brought up some things that they accepted. He went to basically commonalities. What do you understand? What kind of things would be important for you to, to be able to click with and to grasp? He mentioned the, the civil. In a book I wrote uh, years ago um, on prophecy, I cited some things from, from the civil. Some people criticized me from doing that. It isn't that we accept pagan writings as divine. But sometimes there's a way to reach people. And actually because back then I cited uh, non-biblical prophets, prophecies, if you will, various secular organizations were willing to go out and listen. If you just come straight with the Bible, something I don't want to hear any just Bible stuff. But if you talk about how non-biblical things sometimes, or historical things, or prophecies, or whatever, tie in with Scripture, then they're not so afraid of it, because they think it's more open-minded, broad-minded, and you have an opportunity to get your point across, which is essentially what Paul did to the men of Athens in Acts chapter 17. Now, one of the problems with Theophilus, as I mentioned before, is that Theophilus, eh, he was a poetic writer, but also he was a Greek. And why is that important? Well, a lot of early leaders uh, were Hebrews, and so they read the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew. Well, Theophilus was a Greek, and he tended to read from a portion of the Old, uh, a translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint was sometimes referred to in the Old Testament, New Testament, but not very much. Uh, they uh, would tend to do more of a direct translation of the Hebrew into uh, the Greek language. Well, Theophilus, and remember, back in Theophilus' time, it wasn't like now. Like now, we've got the internet. And you can go up various Bible versions. You'll go up the Septuagint versus uh, uh, the, well, the Received Text for the, for the New Testament. But you can look at all kinds of biblical scripts and translations and whatever, and they're all available. Uh, and they're free. I and mean, it would be the Septuagint versus the Masoretic Text is what I was trying to say. And there's also the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's all kinds of stuff. But back in Theophilus' time, there weren't so many books. Books were very, very, very expensive. And he seemed to sometimes rely on the Septuagint, which was a translation that some Greek Jews did uh, prior to his time. And there were mistakes in that. And when he, with his mistakes, he has some mistakes uh, because there was a mistake in Septuagint. So he's got some errors in some of his dates. 
And yes, throughout history, various Church of God writers have had some uh, errors with, with dates. But I don't believe that uh, disproves that uh, he was uh, uh, a Church of God leader. So what have we learned about Theophilus? Well, one, he was not ashamed to be called a Christian. And that was considered a derogatory term. But he said, no, he was not ashamed of it. Two, he said, no, Christians, we don't have idols. God is beyond that. Uh, whether it's uh, the sky or the sun or the moon or reptiles or supposedly great men who became deities and things people made out of their hands. It's no, we don't, we don't do that. It's not God. It's not how God actually is. He taught that God had emotions, that God gets angry. He was more of a biblical literalist than the Greco-Romans, uh, particularly people like uh, uh, Origen of Alexandria. He kept the Sabbath. He promoted the Sabbath. He talked about the seventh day. He said the world uh, basically calls something the Sabbath. They don't even know what it is. He promoted, he promoted all of the Ten Commandments. He used things that uh, his audience understood. He mentions the names of some pagan deities. He cited uh, prophets or prophecies to get his points across. Because uh, Serapion came after him, and Serapion said the texts were handed down. Theophilus would have had the correct New Testament. Because people in Theophilus' area uh, kept Passover the 14th, he would have kept Passover on the 14th. So, despite the fact that the Greco Roman Protestants considered Theophilus to be a saint, uh, one of their saints, the reality is he had doctrines much closer to the Church of God. Now, why is any of this important? The reason this is important is as we get closer to the time of the end, we're seeing more of an ecumenical interfaith thing form. We're seeing people saying, well, this person is part of their church, or this, this is okay, and doctrine doesn't matter. Well, actually, doctrine does matter. Doctrine has to do with teachings and truth. And the truth is that people like Theophilus would not have possibly been in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, even though they have them in the succession list, uh, or uh, the bulk of the Protestant churches. He held doctrinal positions that are closer to those held by the continuing Church of God. So, when people try to tell you that they have apostolic succession, and the Eastern Orthodox claim it for one way, or the Church of Rome claims it another way, or even when they all get, to get together, if we pay attention to what early writers wrote, you can determine those who were truly uh, promoting the faith once for all over the saints and those who are not. Despite some of his flaws and limitations, it appears that Theophilus was a Church of God leader, but even if he wasn't, his beliefs and his writings are much more consistent with those of the Church of God than they are with the Greco-Roman Protestant faith. To learn more about early Christianity and the teachings of the early Christians, I strongly recommend you continue to uh, study your Bible as well as to check out some things that we have in our free book, The Continuing History of Church of God, also available at ccug.org, as well as all the other books and booklets we have available. Church history is important. I know for some people they think it's sort of a boring subject, but the reality is one way to prove that we in the Continuing Church of God do contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints is to look, what, look at what early writers taught about Christianity and Christian doctrines. And we hold to the doctrines that those who were faithful to the teachings of the apostles hold through this day. This is Dr. Bob Teal, the Continuing Church of God.